Elizabeth Taylor was considered one of the last, if not the last, major star to have come out of the old Hollywood studio system. She was known internationally for her beauty, especially for her violet eyes, with which she captured audiences early on in her youth and kept the world hooked on ever since. Taylor was born on February the 27th, 1932 in London, England. Her mother Sarah and her father Francis were American though and art dealers from St. Louis, Missouri. Her father had gone to London initially to set up a gallery. Her mother had been an actress on stage but gave up that vocation when she married. Elizabeth lived in London until the age of seven when the family left for the US when the clouds of war began brewing in Europe in 1939. They sailed without her father, who stayed behind to wrap up the loose ends of the art business. Elizabeth Taylor's childhood was an unhappy one. She began acting when she was just nine years old, and being thrust into the spotlight only served to incite the anger of her father. When I was a little girl, my father was abusive when he drank, and seemed to like to bat me around a bit, she told Barbara Walters in a 1999 interview. Taylor said that she later made peace with her father's abuse after she had left home and had children of her own. I started thinking about my father and how it must have felt for him to have his nine-year-old daughter making more money than he was when he had been this very proud, beautiful, dignified man, she said. I don't blame him. He was drunk. I know he didn't mean to do it. He didn't know what he was doing. Before she was even in her teens, Elizabeth Taylor had become a successful Hollywood star, but fame was far from idyllic for the young actress. Instead of enjoying her new career, Taylor was made miserable by the film studio. I was nine when I made my first films in Hollywood, she told Rolling Stone. I was used from the day I was a child and utilized by the studio. I was promoted for their pockets. One incident in particular stuck in Taylor's memory. MGM co-founder Louis B. Mayer, one of the most influential people in the early days of Hollywood, began screaming at Taylor's mother saying, I took you and your daughter out of the gutter. Taylor defended her mother. I uttered my first swear word and told them that he didn't dare speak to my mother that way and he and the studio could both go to hell and that I was never going to go back to his office, she said. She was just 15 years old at the time. Elizabeth Taylor's first major role was in the 1944 film National Velvet, in which she played a horse-loving girl who disguises herself as a jockey. Her affection for horses required no acting at all. Taylor had an affinity for animals and had been around horses since she was a little girl. I have always preferred animals to little girls or boys, she said. I had my first horse, actually it was a Newfoundland pony, when I was three, and I loved riding without anyone shackling me, riding bareback as fast as I could. Elizabeth Taylor remains one of the most iconic actresses in Hollywood history. Her legendary beauty and prodigious acting talent have captivated generations of fans. Taylor's talent was innate and the star didn't have any formal training in her craft. Instead, she honed her skills by watching others. I have never had an acting lesson in my life, she said, but I've learned, I hope, from watching other people like Spencer Tracy, Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift, and Jimmy Dean, all people who were finely tuned and educated in the art of acting. They were my education. Taylor was determined to grow as an actress and not be molded by directors, saying she did her best work by being guided, not by being forced. She added, If you describe me as an actress, you'd have to say that I wasn't a distinctive actress as actresses go, because I'm certainly not a polished technician. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. Elizabeth Taylor had seven husbands in total, but had eight weddings as she married and divorced her fifth husband, Richard Burton, twice. Many think Burton, her fifth husband, was the great love of her life while she described him as just one of her soulmates, along with another husband, Mike Todd, the only husband Taylor didn't divorce but who tragically died in a plane crash. 
Taylor did remain fond of Burton long after their divorces though and continued to wear a 33 carat diamond ring he had given her. She described herself as a romantic who was willing to change herself to make her husbands happy. Her seventh husband John Warner was a politician and Taylor went into semi-retirement after marrying him, settling into the life of a politician's spouse. Being a senator's wife was quite different from being a Hollywood star. Washington is the hardest town for a woman in the world, especially if you're married to a politician, Taylor said. If the woman is the politician, then it might be quite different. But if you're wedded to the politician, it's like your lips are sealed, you are a robot. I am deeply, privately spiritual, Elizabeth Taylor said in 1997. I've always been interested in spiritual things. Taylor was captivated by Kabbalah, an ancient Jewish tradition of mysticism. Although she made it clear that this was a spiritual pursuit and not a religious one. Kabbalah is not conformist, she said. You don't have to be Jewish to believe in it. It's not a religion. It coincides with many of my beliefs. She was not against organized religion, however. She grew up in the Christian scientist faith, although she converted to Judaism after the death of her third husband, Mike Todd. I needed, after Mike's death, some very strong faith to keep me alive, something to hang on to, she said on CNN's Larry King Live. I didn't find it in Christian science, and I wanted to be close to Mike. So I studied Judaism for a year after his death and then converted. Taylor had many pets throughout her life and even had monkeys in her home while living in Africa. Towards the end of her life, Taylor had a Maltese dog named Sugar who accompanied her everywhere. I've never loved a dog like this in my life, she said in 2004. It's amazing. Sometimes I think there's a person in there. Perhaps one of the greatest tests of Elizabeth Taylor's talent was concealing the chronic pain she lived with for most of her life. She was born with scoliosis, a condition which curves the spine. Her condition grew progressively worse as she grew older, but Taylor maintained a sense of humor about the pain that became a constant companion. I was born with it, but it has finally caught up with me, she said in 2004. My body's a real mess. If you look at it in the mirror, it's just completely convex and concave. I've become one of those poor little old women who's bent sideways. My x-rays are hysterical. The bone doctors just throw up their hands and say, sorry, there's nothing we can do, which is so cheery. She joked about the fact that she was still going strong in her 70s. People must think, my God, she's still alive, she said. But there's some resilience in me that makes me keep fighting. It's the damnedest thing. I just keep coming back. By 1997, Elizabeth Taylor had been a legend for decades. Her status as a cultural icon was secure and she was in a position to retire on her vast wealth and enjoy the fruits of fame if she wished. Instead, she threw herself into AIDS advocacy, becoming the founding chair of the American Foundation for AIDS Research and then going on to form the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. She traveled all over the world to educate people about the disease, feeling an urge to create a lasting impression on the world beyond her films. I find being Elizabeth Taylor really boring, she said, explaining why she was so focused on her advocacy work. I think if you were born with privileges or given privileges, then you should just share them. Like money, it's to share. I've known too many people who just sat and hoarded and were miserable. Just miserable sons of bitches. I have always believed that giving is one of the reasons that we were put on this earth. I've acted on that belief since I was old enough to leave my nest. Most famous people find themselves the subject of tabloid fodder at some point in their lives. But the public's fascination with Elizabeth Taylor was seemingly never-ending. Her long and prolific career, along with her turbulent personal life, made her a frequent media target. Taylor resented how the press handled her image and said that she was far different from how she was portrayed in the news. I'm not some strange kind of coiled person, she said in 1981. I guess interviewers need a handle and for some reason, don't ask me why, 
they like to make me sound off-putting. But I learned that very, very young, that the minute you start believing your own publicity, you're in a world of trouble. So I take the hubbub surrounding my life with a dose of salts, a big dose. She credited her parents with keeping her grounded. The problem is that the media have made my life out to lack dignity by not allowing me the privacy I require and by fabrication, she said. Even though she worked for most of her life starting her acting career while still a child, Elizabeth Taylor never slowed down. She kept acting long after people thought she would have retired and she spent her later years working as an AIDS activist even in the face of her own declining health. In 1981, then in her late 40s, Taylor made her stage debut in a revival of The Little Foxes. She had more than 50 films under her belt, two Oscars, and was busy in politics as the wife of Senator John Warner, but decided to turn her skills to theatre simply because she could. I'm well enough off not to have to work, she said. No one has a gun at my head, but I act because I like it. Taylor was adamant that it was her love of acting that kept her driven rather than a desire to stay relevant and prove herself. I have a very sound ego, I think, she said. I don't have to go out fighting windmills or trying to prove things. Certainly not to other people. That would be a waste of energy. Taylor overcame a litany of health problems throughout the 1990s, from diabetes to congestive heart failure. She had both hips replaced in 1997 and had a brain tumor removed. In October 2009, Taylor underwent successful heart surgery. In early 2011, Taylor again experienced heart problems. She was admitted to Cedar sinai Hospital that February for congestive heart failure and on March the 23rd, 2011, Taylor passed away from the condition. Elizabeth Taylor credited Montgomery Clift with making her take acting seriously. Taylor was so impressed by Clift's incredible preparation and concentration to play a role that she actively began to seek better parts and give more dynamic performances. She had a great and loyal friendship with 1950s actor James Dean who co-starred with her in Giant in 1956. When Dean suddenly died in a car accident in California in the early fall of 1955, just before the filming of Giant was wrapping up production, it was reported that Taylor felt so distressed and devastated upon hearing the news of her good friend's tragic death that she had to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital for a few days. Elizabeth Taylor appeared on the cover of Life magazine a record 14 times, more than any other movie star, starting when she was just 15 years old. And she was engaged 13 times, 8 followed by marriage, and 5 that she called off. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favourite Elizabeth Taylor role or moment in her career that you perhaps keep going back to? Let us know in the comments below. And if you haven't already done so, click the like button and stay updated on all of our latest content.